Hi, my beloved Hebrew students. I'm back, uh, and uh, I'm going to walk us through our lectures, our Prezi lectures that we normally do. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Um, that we normally do uh, via lecture uh, in class, and uh, I've tried to kind of go back and reformat this so that potentially it gives you as much of that experience as possible because we do a lot of discussion and a lot of breakdown uh, in class. So I also wanted to let, give you the heads up that some of these lectures will be a little long uh, as they are put together for a two day or sometimes even a three day stretch. So if you need, you find yourself needing to stop uh, and go back or take a break, that's absolutely uh, actually recommended uh, for you to do. And uh, I hope uh, that this helps you a lot. Uh, and I just also want to say, I just really miss you guys, and I hope you're all safe and healthy. But let's get started talking about David and Solomon and continue our work in the period of the monarchy. Okay, so uh, really quickly, uh, let's do a quick overview here. And uh, I'm going to move myself a little out of the frame there. Okay. Um, so, most uh, folks, when they think about kings, especially Hebrew kings, think of David. Uh, and a great part of that is that David's influence, uh, both figuratively and in narrative, is pretty profound um, in the Hebrew scriptures. And he'll go on even to influence as a figure in terms of narrative, um, the Messianic traditions that will become really important to those early Christians. Um, but in terms of what we're looking at here in first and second Samuel and in first and second Kings, uh, we're up to speed now. Remember we ended uh, with the lament um, by David of uh, Jonathan and Saul, his father-in-law. So we end with that lament, which is the mark uh, of David's ascension uh, in uh, the, the succession of the throne. And so uh, he's anointed by Samuel, and this begins uh, his reign. Uh, David is pretty important too in terms of his covenant. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty big one. Of the three that we've studied now, we have the Abrahamic covenant, we have looked at the Mosaic covenant, and this is the last of the great three covenants. So if you're hearing some language that sounds familiar from our covenant work, that's deliberate. Um, and out of the Davidic covenant comes the Messianic tradition or the Messiah tradition. That's a big term and a big word. We're going to talk a little bit more about it later. But some just kind of big overview kind of stuff. David is pretty important because David accomplishes what Saul could not, which is he gets all the tribes at the table. He's, he gets all 12 of them to come aboard. Um, and he does this with primarily a lot of military success. And where Saul failed... Uh, David succeeds, and the big, big success for David is his retrieval of the Ark of the Covenant and the defeat uh, of the Philistines. Boo, right? Um, <clears throat> and so when he does that, he, he gains some kind of political uh, uh, power, uh, and he uses that to do a couple things. One of the things he does is he establishes Jerusalem as the capital, uh, politically and religiously, for Israel. Uh, and he takes the Ark of the Covenant that he has successfully gotten back for the people of Israel, and he places it in Jerusalem. So that means that everybody is coming to Jerusalem, um, and they're coming for both their political and also economic uh, reasons, but they're also coming to Jerusalem for religious worship. So that's a really important development that happens under David. David is also really important, and I mentioned this just a little bit ago, that he extends uh, what the notion of the king looks like. There's a kind of way he develops the imagination for the king. And probably the biggest characteristic that we will see uh, in the Davidic literature is this idea that good kings protect their people. Um, you know, we've talked about this a little bit uh, in class already. Um, you know, this is an idea I think we take for granted, but uh, you know, it's, it's certainly one that would have been really important in the ancient world. But if you think about it in terms of theologically how it develops out, um, it, it is really important uh, because 
uh, that that aspect of the kingship continues on even through first century messianic traditions that we're going to see that are especially ones associated with a idea of a David 2.0 uh, kind of happening. But in any case, this idea that the, a good king protects his people uh, is definitely developed by David. And in fact, when we're looking at the prof, uh, the prophetic materials uh, next week and the following week after that, when those prophets are going in on the kings, uh, one of the principles that they under, they will use to accuse them and even um, as a way of interpreting why all the bad things are happening is that somehow these kings have failed their people. Uh, and uh, and it's and the moral uh, responsibility or culpability is on the king. Uh, any case, uh, you know, he also, with for all these wonderful things about David, David, David's a hot mess. David gets into trouble quite a bit. And we've talked about this too. This is one of the most beautiful things about these, these stories, these narratives about the Hebrew art of storytelling is they just kind of weave all of this into their, their identity and their story. Uh, and David, David gets into trouble quite a bit. The story that probably encapsulates uh, David's problems is the story of Bathsheba. And just really quickly for that story is, uh, you know, uh, Bathsheba is uh, the wife of one of David's great soldiers in his army, uh, Uriah the Hittite. And uh, in any case, David is up on a rooftop and he sees Bathsheba taking uh, a bath and uh, it's love at first sight, at least for him. Uh, and uh, he asks about her and upon learning that she's married and to whom, uh, he works with his advisors to devise a plan to get rid of Uriah conveniently. Uh, and he does so by having Uriah and Uriah's company uh, go to the forefront of a battle line where the battle is pretty awful. And on a signal, everyone else steps back and it exposes Uriah to the enemy uh, who essentially kill him. Um, and so in this sort of uh, murder um, by process, uh, he gets rid of Uriah and then sweeps in on his, the grieving widow to comfort her. And well, you can imagine this is not something that goes over very well with Yahweh. Um, so the prophet Nathan comes in and there's kind of a famous story. Nathan shows up at court and says to David, I'm here to tell you the story about a rich man and a poor man. And David says, well, give it to me. He says, you know, you have to, in your kingdom, a rich man and a poor man. And the poor man has one lamb whom he loves very, very much. And the rich man has many, many lambs. And so one afternoon, the rich man has a guest join him. And so he, the rich man orders his servants to go out and slaughter a lamb and to prepare a great feast. But he says to his servants, the rich man says to his servants, uh, don't take any of ours, go next door and get the lamb of our neighbor. And so the poor man's lamb is taken, slaughtered, and fed to the rich man's guest. And, you know, upon hearing this story, David is incensed with anger and righteousness and says, who is this person? Bring them to my court. Let them face my justice. And Nathan kind of coolly says, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, I'm looking at him, to which the whole court goes, ooh, like, right? Uh, in any case, uh, this was the reprimand uh, that Nathan, as a prophet, gives uh, David as king. Now, remember, we've been looking at that, that tension there to the pillars of the king who is there to care for the people in the interest of Israel, primarily as a protector, and the prophet whose primary function is to speak on behalf of God and put a check on the king, right? Because remember those anti marnock group, they were very concerned, and those that's kind of transitioned and involved. They were concerned that people would forget where the true power comes from. And so part of the function of the prophet is to constantly remind everyone, most especially the king, that his authority and his power comes through God alone. So uh, Nathan reminds him of that and reprimands him, calls him to conversion. This is what will lead eventually to the Davidic covenant. We'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, in part of what David does is, uh, you know, after he seeks to reconcile with God is he uh, asks, uh, uh, he wants to build a temple for God. And at first, Nathan thinks this is a pretty okay idea. 
uh, and then doesn't. Uh, so God tells him to say otherwise. And so the temple is put on hold for a little while, but uh, Solomon will pick up that a little bit later and we'll talk about the consequences of that idea. But as we kind of continue on here, so one of the things that we do in class a lot is we do these like focus uh, texts where we sit together and kind of work through this material. So the thing I would like you to do right now, if you could, is hit pause on this video and open up your Bibles or uh, your electronic device uh, if you have your Bible app and look at 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7 verses 8 through 17. So pause the presentation and read through that passage because the next slide that I'm going to go through with you is pretty, is based on that. But I want you to, to keep up your reading skills, your exegetical skills here. And the question I want you to do is just in your notes there, outline the key message of this passage and ask yourself sort of like get those details in, remember your verse work because you will have, to, we still have that final exam and it'll still ask you to kind of pull together a whole bunch of stuff. So um, make sure that you're, you're taking, you're looking through that. So once you're done with uh, the reading through that, go ahead and move on to the next uh, part of our presentation. And let's talk about it. So welcome back from your pause. Second uh, Samuel chapter seven, verses eight through 17. Those are really, uh, it's a really interesting set of passage here because uh, in this uh, passage, we get a couple things that are pretty important. The idea, as I say here, of an eternal and unconditional covenant between Yahweh and the house of David happens in this uh, passage. So again, if you've got that scripture piece, go ahead and pull it up. I'm looking at mine on my phone here, gang. Um, and let's just kind of look at that. Uh, so, now then tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people of Israel. So really clearly, right out of the gate, remember, we're getting where does David's authority to rule come from, and what is the purpose of a king? So in that first verse, he's laying that down, right? And we also get in this that, you know, as you read a little bit further down, uh, you know, God is kind of assuring him of things, but he is also saying to David, right, you know, that because David's kind of freaked out that what will happen to happen to Saul where God uh, removes all of Saul's inher uh, heirs will also happen to David. And he promises him in this passage, hey, I'm not going to take away your household, you, your children, your house will endure. And in fact, not only does he make that promise to David that his house will endure, he says, you know, he calls David's son. That's a really, really important moment because what that does is two things. When Yahweh or God adopts David, right, as his son, one, we got this adoption piece that's really important. And for those of you that will go on and take an advanced Hebrew class with, say, Dr. Sherman, or you maybe are gonna do some kind of uh, advanced work in history and you look at some of these courses, adoption is a really big piece uh, theologically in rabbinical literature, right? And we'll see it work itself out in a lot of material. But he adopts David as his son. And what that does is it allows God to frankly chew David out like a father can chew out a son. But the inverse of that is that it also binds God, binds Yahweh to David in a unique way, because there are things that one can only ask of one's parents, right? And again, you know, I've always encouraged you guys to think really practically, because there is always that sensibility, that element or characteristic in these materials. By binding himself to David, he underscores the covenantal promise that David's house will endure from David's house, right? Uh, eventually we get this idea that from David's house, the Messiah will come, the one that will set everything right. So in the same breath that Yahweh adopts him so that he can correct David as only a father can uh, and make a claim of authority on David, he also opens himself up to David, right? That David can ask of God things that only a child can. Now, one thing to remember here, the 
that uh, we've been looking at is when I, and we've shared with you, anytime you see a major figure like this, then you should potentially look at, is this a stand-in, right? We've talked about that tension between the individual and the communal. David here being potentially a stand-in for Israel, right? So it's not just David that gets bound to God, it's Israel that gets bound to God in this uh, parent-child dynamic, right? We've looked at a couple of those. We've seen the master-servant, we've seen the parent-child, I want to bring that up because when we get down to maybe I think it's module three or module four and we're looking at Hosea, that whole adoption and those rubrics are going to get upended. But it's really important to see because this really cements this idea of this father-child relationship, not only between David, but also between Israel and God. So you can hear that uh, a lot in the art and the culture and things like that. So I uh, just want to kind of point that out to you. But the sonship of the king is pretty different, especially when we think about the potential replacement of the nation as the firstborn of God, right? So one of the things I say here in my slide is this move really does introduce a royal ideology, right? In which the main themes of the Pentateuch narrative are no longer minded. We've made a departure, right? At this point, up to now, right? Who gets to lead, how the authority gets worked out, very different, right? Now the authority gets worked out by who is the child of God, right? Who is the heir? So the focus of the king's internal covenant with Yahweh rather than the people's conditional covenant. Now look at those two things there. Because we are now bound like by family, it's an internal covenant. It's not conditional. It's not an if then anymore. It's, it's this is what will happen. So that's a real big shift. And you're gonna see that shift in how that language, that narrative and the theological practices that shape around that, especially around the temple, really start to kind of coalesce and crystallize for that. So as I share with you on the slide, Israel's redemption becomes bound up in David and his dynasty. So even matters of succession become part of this piece in a way that we haven't experienced before. Um, and so just so shortly before what we did with the period of the judges, right? Somebody is called for here. It's, it's through a bloodline, right? Um, and we also are introduced in this passage to the term Messiah, and this is a, a really important term. It's going to develop, it's going to evolve, it's going to have a lot of different trajectories. As I shared at the beginning of this talk, by the time you get to the first century Roman Empire with six million Jews by census data from the Romans, um, the number of mess messianic or messiah trajectories or ideas out there, um, there's there's four or five main ones, but that's they, that's not all there is. It's it, there's a quite a diversity, especially as it reflects the diversity of the Jewish community. But here, I think uh, from this passage, and uh, Dr. Collins talks about this in your textbook a bit, is that this is primarily a reference to the fact that kings were initiated into an office by the pouring of anointing of oil in the head. So David was an anointed king, a Messiah as is every king and high priest in Israel, right? And we know that becomes a standard practice uh, for this. So uh, I shared here too, uh, in terms of uh, the Hebrew imagination, David is second in importance and in textual space to Moses, right? So one of the things we've looked at is how other texts or concepts are carried forward and who gets a lot of mentions. Moses never goes away. David will pick up and stay with us. And we're going to be talking about David for the rest of the, our five weeks together. So uh, that's a really important thing to know. Uh, so, and then some little facts here uh, about why David was so popular. But uh, moving right along, I got the blue button there. <clears throat> so the next thing I want to look at, since we're talking about succession, uh, is another pause here. If you don't I uh, to on the screen and I'd like you to pause here for 2 Samuel chapters 9 through 20 and 1 Kings uh, chapters 1 through 2 and I want you to pause uh, on the lecture and take a look at these chapters that are sometimes called the court narrative probably more widely known as the succession narrative 
and ask yourself what's going on here. Just in your first pass, ask yourself like what, how would you summarize what's happening? What's the vibe or the tone that you're getting from these passages? And just kind of jot that down. Like how is this reading to you? And then I want to ask would you do this, you know, we've done this a couple of times. So I want you to ask yourself why that tone that you're getting from your pass at this, you know, I want you to think critically and think about this and what you've learned so far about kingship. You know that the whole king thing was not uh, a clear, clear piece. It's, it's wrought with a lot of tension. Uh, and we even saw with Saul and now we're seeing with David, it's complicated, right? Uh, so ask yourself potentially what maybe is contributing to the tone or the feeling that you're getting from that text and think about it in the wider context of what you already know about the topic or issue of kingship. And then in your textbook on page 60, Dr. Collins uh, actually describes these narratives in an interesting way. And I, I've been using his textbook for a long time, but it always catches my eye because he writes about these narratives as an apology for the succession of Solomon to kingship, right? Why would Dr. Collins use that language to describe the what we call court or succession narrative, right? So if you haven't looked at that or it's been a while since you looked at that, that piece in there, check that out and drop that down in your notes. That may show up again in a really important moment at the end of the semester. So moving on to breaking some of this down, as I said, the second Sam 920, first Kings one through two contains that succession narrative, David, um, and one of the things that we see is that each of David's sons is killed one by one or displaced until finally Solomon is chosen. Um, and we get a new portrayal of David. Remember what we saw with Saul when David was on the rise? Saul was on the descent, right? We're seeing that again. When anytime you see someone's stature rise, especially in the monarchical literature, you can expect to see paralleling that someone else's descent. And just like we saw in uh, the materials, you know, you can go three or four passages in the same chapter uh, and see, oh, how great this person is. And then flip right around and what, how like unfit they are to be a leader. Uh, it's kind of like reading Twitter today. Uh, in any case, we get this portrait of David that is weak He's indecisive. He's not the hero that we uh, were introduced to, the brave, you know, uh, guy that took on the Philistines, right, and got the Ark of the Covenant. You know, in fact, the David we're presented with in these narratives is a David that doesn't even want to go into battle. And remember the last king that didn't want to do battle and represent or protect his people? That was the critical line that we saw in the story that said, hey, uh, and, you know, and then, of course, the whole adultery murder thing, generally, when you're breaking some of those covenant uh, rules, the Mosaic covenant rules, not a good look, right? And the whole family, it just falls into dysfunction. Um, so, uh, in fact, he has his son, Absalom. Uh, this is where Faulkner gets Absalom, Absalom, for those of you that are doing literature uh, majors, uh, leads the revolt against him. Uh, and David has to hightail it out uh, out of town for a little while, and he's stripped of his crown and made fun of and degraded. And then we have Nathan and Bathsheba who plot to have Solomon succeed David. You know, their relationship started on a rocky bend, and it seems to be ending on a rocky note. Uh, and then on top of that, if that wasn't enough, uh, always in the distance is sort of the drumbeat that the northern tribes are not digging uh, the situation at all. They, they have different concerns than the folks in the south, because that's where Jerusalem is, is in the southern part of Israel. Um, the ten tribes in the north, not feeling it so much. Uh, they don't feel like they benefit from a lot of the things. They feel disconnected. Uh, from what's happening in Jerusalem and that decisions are made really without a lot of their input. Uh, and there's a kind of just kind of drumbeat in the distance. It's a warning sign of something bigger that's going to happen. So in terms of the literary analysis of these texts, you're not going to find some, 
prose more beautiful. This is some really gorgeous Hebrew prose. And for those of you that are my language students, uh, this is your moment here. I encourage you really just to, to uh, go through these texts. Uh, and those of you that just like a good drama, a good sleazy drama, uh, you're not going to find anything better than what we just are going to go through here because there is glory and power grabs and lust and crime, uh, all the works, uh, anything that would make a great HBO TV show, it's all there. The writing style is what we might call realist. It, it's just everything is out for everyone to see. It's very concerned with portraying life as it is and not really hiding anything from anyone or whitewashing it. Uh, there's no flattery given to David, right, uh, in, the, in his end. His demise is really awful. It's ugly. He's, he's half the man that we were introduced to um, and depicted, as I say here, in really human terms. So in the succession, uh, one of the things I want to just kind of pull you back to here is to look at this whole dynamic that we've seen in the monarchy and note how the succession of Saul and the succession of David play out, right? David has two opportunities to kill Saul undetected. This is a bit of a review from stuff we've done before. But he refuses to harm him. He piously, like, oh, yeah, he's such a good guy. All right. He does defect with 600 men to the Philistines and swears loyalty to them. So there's a little bit of betrayal already there, but you know, um, but David forcibly excluded for, is, is removed from the attack uh, against the Israelites. He never fights against the Israelites uh, at Mount Gilboa. And that's where Saul and Jonathan are both killed. So David's removed from that crime. Um, then we have David routing the uh, Amalekites and then dividing all the spoils of war throughout Judah. It does, it's a kind of calculated move because uh, just like when we get tax breaks, it makes people happy. People like money. Uh, they like having that. And so his spreading out of that wealth uh, wins him some new friends and some good faith. Uh, and then we read through this together where he publicly laments Saul, right? He does the classy thing. He brings those people, those still folks that might have been pro-Saul and against him, especially given that whole like defection and fighting with the bad guys kind of thing. It gives, gives him a little bit of cover and the opportunity to let them say face and say, oh, but you know, okay, you know, he's a good guy. He, he, he laments Saul and praises him and as a way of kind of bringing that unification. Note that all of Saul's heirs, much like David's will be, are eliminated. Uh, and David, that's how David ascends the throne. One of the things I wanted to show you is that these succession narratives are not just fun, drama-driven kind of things but they have within them a function. And the function of this kind of narrative is to be a critique of kingship. The messiness that we see with both David and Saul really exposes the weaknesses of a king, right? And it exposes that really no human can do what God can do. So it's, it's constantly there. And this is a kind of important piece there. This is why we call the uh, Deuteronomist historian really is saying that these kings, these kings are only human. They're not divine. They cannot do what Yahweh can do. So don't get that mixed up. Okay. So moving on to Solomon's reign, um, you know, his reign is interesting. Like in the, in the text, uh, especially in first Kings in those early chapters, we get, we get a lot of like flourish about how off, awesome he is and a lot of praise and these kinds of things. We, most people, if they know a Solomon story, know about Solomon's wisdom uh, or they know about the temple uh, and all of those things are part of it. Now, Dr. Collins does a really great job. I'm not going to spend time in the lecture doing this, but uh, the archeological, sociological, some of the forensic stuff that they've done uh, examining uh, all of that kind of, aspects of Solomon's reign about what might be true, what's not quite true. I'm going to leave that to you and Dr. Collins, your background. But for us, in terms of theological function, Solomon's kind of important because Solomon, you know, and we talked about his flourish. We all, there's also this tension that somehow, you know, some of his practices, especially potentially worshiping foreign gods, 
uh, calls him into subject. Remember the idolatry thing always gets, gets the Hebrews in trouble. Um, but, uh, you know, in the middle of all that tension is the temple. Uh, and where David leaves off, so, uh, Solomon will pick up and he does begin the construction of the temple. And it's a mixed bag, just like the kings that, that seek to build it. Uh, it's a mixed bag, right? But the temple itself becomes a really powerful symbol. Uh, and the theology that, that starts to coalesce and starts to crystallize and form uh, becomes incredibly important uh, in terms of elements of Hebrew identity. Uh, in fact, uh, when the temple is destroyed for the second and final time in 70 CE by the Romans, uh, the temple will be destroyed two times. And we're going to talk about the first time here in this lecture. But the descriptions of that destruction are absolutely devastating. It's personal, right? Because the temple represents symbolically God amongst the people. And we've talked since Genesis that one of the biggest themes uh, in these narratives is the proximity or presence of God, because at the heart of all of this is a relationship. And the temple becomes one of those outward symbols of that relationship, that here's where God dwells. So all the rituals, all the sacrifice, just going to Jerusalem and seeing it, right? This is a way in which... Um, becomes a really important uh, symbol to that, that identity. So uh, when it's destroyed by the Babylonians, uh, it, you know, even so with Ezekiel, who will have a vision, Ezekiel will say, and this is to kind of highlight that relational piece, he will describe in his vision that the Lord is leaving Jerusalem. The destruction of the temple is equated with the absence of God. You know, even though God himself isn't trapped by that, right? But it, it, in certainly his presence or movement is there. There were different ways that you have that described, both in the sacred narratives and some of the materials that move alongside them. When Ezekiel is having that vision, and it looks like we're on, you know, the the cliff of this this major event happening, um, it's as though it's, uh, someone that's so significant is leaving home, right? Um, and it's <laughs> a really dark, dark vision for them. So the other part of that, though, is that the temple as a, as an event, uh, as it's being built, even, uh, reflects the kind of messiness of the kingship, because, you know, the temple inside of the temple being built and all the formation of ritualized worship is, again, in the background, this ever-growing fracturing between the various tribes, what David was able to bring together and hold, um, the kings that after David are not able to really do. And that tension really starts to spark uh, with the, both the taxes being levied and practice of forced labor uh, as in, towards, mostly towards the temple in Jerusalem. The 10 tribes in the north didn't feel they were really benefiting from any of these things that were happening, but were paying the cost and the price for this. Um, and so eventually they separate with the 10 tribes uh, of the north forming Israel and the two tribes of the south forming Judah. Now, this is where we'll stop with Solomon's stuff, but I want to say as this transitions, I'm going to leave, leave the rest of that little gap in chapter 14 for you to fill out. But uh, in our next set of lectures, where we're going to uh, start with the prophetic literature uh, and, uh, and work through some of that material, uh, the background of that is set into motion in what you're, you're reading here in First and Second Kings with the fracturing of, of the kingdom, right? This is a family falling apart, right? And the family is falling apart, uh, and that is kind of exponential like breaking and fracturing is going to be played upon. You've seen that before. You remember those torque texts, right? Once one relationship breaks, when that primary relationship between God and humanity uh, is ruptured, it leads to a rupture of other really significant relationships. 
Now, all of the, the healings, all of those miracles take place inside of those relationships as a sign of some kind of restoration or promise that's to come. But I think what you're seeing here in this sort of national scale, and this is why that was so important to also remember that when you read uh, David, read Israel, right? Uh, David is at once his own person in this, but the king is also the representative of the people. So what the, the, the people are experiencing here is the separation, right? So looking forward in 722 BCE, the Assyrians will conquer Israel. That's the 10 tribes of the north. In fact, they will become known as the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, and they're going to be scattered all throughout Samaria. Um, the Judah, which is the uh, southern part of the kingdom where Jerusalem is located, is able to kind of put off the Assyrians uh, through a series of treaties, which are going to be heavily criticized by some of the prophets. Um, we're going to talk about that in the next uh, two weeks. Um, but they're able to hold on for a little while, but they can't hold on forever because if it's not the Assyrians knocking on the door, it's going to be the Babylonians. And the Babylonians will conquer uh, Judah in 586 BCE. They're going to destroy the temple for the first time, and it is going to be devastating. Uh, so we're going to look at the literature that surrounds that, primarily through Jeremiah and some of the others, uh, and what that's like. Um, the Jewish population under the Babylonians is kind of common practice, uh, will be scattered throughout the empire for uh, 50 years. And it's not until Cyrus of Persia, uh, who liberates the Jews that are in, uh, in the diaspora, uh, and he liberates them, allows them to return back to Jerusalem. Some are gonna elect to do it, others are going to stay where they are. I mean, they've started families and businesses and things. But uh, some do go back to Jerusalem and they're not really well received, uh, not all of them. Um, and there's, it's a really important moment in Hebrew identity because it reflects some old tensions um, and some old tensions with newer or more modern or particular issues or problems or uh, elements. And we get some new issues. So we'll talk about some of those as we get going. But the thing to remember here is uh, the kings are over. When the Assyrians take out Israel and when the Babylonians take out uh, Judah, the day of the kings is gone. The sun is kind of set on that. Uh, and the, the group that kind of rises in prominence and rises to the center stage in this are the prophets. And so we're going to spend uh, the great portion of our time together in the remaining weeks looking at these prophets uh, and walking through some of those materials. Uh, because that material will be really significant in shaping uh, Hebrew identity. And we're going to try to think about where some of the departures are, where some of these topics that we've been working on for a long time have evolved, and, uh, and in what new stuff is, is going on. So uh, I hope this has been helpful to you. Again, I really, really miss you guys. I would much rather be in a classroom with you than sitting at my kitchen bar uh, and uh, doing this lecture. Uh, online, but uh, if you have questions, check in. Remember, we will also be doing a Zoom meeting together on Thursdays at 8.45 a.m. until 9.15, and that's a really great time to bring some of your questions uh, to me and to your classmates, and we'll, we'll try to break that down and get you set up as you get ready to go into your IDQ. Take care of yourselves, take care of your families, and take care of your communities. And uh, I'll see you on the internets.